That uh, clearly is in all the headlines right now, Donald Trump. Right. Uh, do, what are your comments on, uh, or what are your take on what he's doing? Well, Kimmy, you know, throughout history, uh, you have had uh, demagogues. Which is ironic because you are one of those demagogues. This is the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of demagogue. A political leader who tries to get support by making false claims and promises and using arguments based on emotion rather than reason, or a leader who makes use of popular prejudices and false claims and promises in order to gain power. Now, as demagogues go, Sanders is one of the more benign types, but he is still a demagogue. Both of those definitions apply as much to Bernie Sanders as they do to Donald Trump. While Trump is more loathsome than Sanders, of course, and more egregious, both use the tactics of a demagogue. Bernie Sanders doesn't trade in false claims so much as he does false promises, though not every claim he makes is true. Certainly the bit about making use of popular prejudices and false promises and using arguments based on emotion rather than reason applies to Sanders. The only defense Sanders can make that he isn't a demagogue is that he is not doing what he is doing to gain power. Rather, many people would, on Sanders' behalf, make the claim that Sanders' campaign is not about putting Sanders in power, he is campaigning to influence Hillary Clinton's campaign and to make her pull to the left, much as Ron Paul tried to do to the Republicans in 2008 and 2012. The problem with this claim, as you will see later in the video, is that Sanders himself refutes it. He, he at least claims to believe that he is going to go all the way and try to gain power for himself. Uh, but first, uh, we've got to get past Secretary Clinton. I think we're going to do that as well. Yeah, okay. I'll put in a disclaimer here, in that I'm not, I'm not targeting Bernie Sanders and saying he is the only demagogue in the race. In fact, it's not even him and Donald Trump who are the only demagogues in the race. It is a sad fact of American electoral politics that demagoguery gets results. Pretty much every candidate in the race is either a complete demagogue or uses elements of demagoguery in their campaign. Demagogues are elected all the time by both parties who peddle in emotion, prejudice, and fantasy rather than logic, reason, and fact. Politicians use demagoguery because it works, and neither party is above using it as a tactic. The reason I'm picking on old man Sanders here is because while Bernie is not the worst of the demagogues, at least the other demagogues have the sense to not call each other out for the shit they are all doing. Uh, you've had uh, demagogues uh, trying to divert attention away from the real issues. This That's right. Demagogues do try to distract from the real issues. And of course, what does he do? He immediately then distracts from real issues. It's why this interview is so funny, is that Sanders is simultaneously describing and demonstrating demagoguery, and he is doing so without any sense of irony. He is blissfully unaware of what he is doing. At one moment he says that demagogues distract from real issues, which is true, and then he goes on to immediately list a bunch of problems which are either imaginary bogeymen or a symptom of much larger, more dangerous problems, as you're about to see. country today faces some enormous problems. You know, we have a middle class that's disappearing, uh, we have almost all new wealth and income going to the top 1%. we got climate change. We have a corrupt campaign finance system. I'll take these one at a time. A middle class that's disappearing. This is a perennial favorite scare tactic used by politicians of both parties in America. They love to trot this out, that the middle class is disappearing, that it's being squeezed. They love to use this because it scares people. Because, of course, most people consider themselves middle class. I mean, I think something like 90% of Americans consider themselves middle class. It's ridiculous how many Americans think they are middle class. And so for politicians to come out and say, the middle class is disappearing, it's, uh, you know, it's a good way of scaring people. But thankfully, it's not really true. I say it's not really true instead of it's completely false, because lots of really good economists aren't quite sure whether it's happening or not. I mean, there are some really good economists who look at it and say, "Yep, middle class is disappearing." And then there are some equally good middle class. Uh, there are some equally good economists who look at it and say, "Well, no, the middle class isn't disappearing." There's also evidence to suggest that if the middle class is disappearing, it's because more and more Americans are moving up from the middle class into the upper class. The middle class is disappearing because the upper class is getting larger and including more people in it. 
The other thing is that, even if fewer people are middle class, so what? That's just a label. If you look at it in concrete terms, Americans are living better lives than ever before. We have longer life expectancies. We have, on average, well, actually, these... Here are some statistics from the U.S. Census Bureau. Now, these are a few years out of date. I couldn't find any more recently. Um, this is a report released on poor households in America, released by the Census Bureau in 2013. 80.9% uh, of households below the federal poverty level have cell phones. So 80% have cell phones. 58.2% of poor households have computers. 96.1% of poor households have a television. So practically every single poor household has a TV in it. And 83.2% of them have a video recording device. Uh, so a DVR or a VCR. <laughs> a VCR. <laughs> uh, 97.8% have refrigerators, 96.6% have gas or electric stoves, 93.2% have microwaves. So pretty much every single poor household in America, these are poor houses, not middle class houses, poor houses, have refrigerators, stoves, and microwaves. You know, and 50 years ago, these were the these were the trappings of the middle class. Poor people didn't have these things. I mean, if you were poor and you had a refrigerator or an electric stove as opposed to a wood-fired one, you, you were rolling in dough. And middle class households and rich households were the only ones to have microwaves. 83% um, of poor households have air conditioning. And I'm guessing that those who don't have air conditioning live in a part of the country where it doesn't really get hot enough to need it. Uh, that's just a guess. 44.9% uh, own dishwashers. You know, they have a dishwasher, not a, not as in a person, but you know, a machine. They have an appliance that does the dishes, and and 26.2 percent, so more than a quarter of poor households have food freezers. You know, these are poor houses, the poor households, according to the Census Bureau. So even if the even if the middle class as a class is shrinking, what it means to be middle class is rapidly becoming, well very difficult to define, which is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to say whether or not the middle class is shrinking, because it's like, how do you define the middle class if poor people have all these, you know, if poor people own the same cell phones that rich people do, and watch the same TV programs, and live in air-conditioned houses, you know, how do you define poor and rich? Now, obviously, we know what rich people are, or at least we think we do, and we know what poor people are, and yet the lines are blurring. So this idea that there's a shrinking middle class is very tenuous at best. The other thing, uh, we have almost all new in we have almost all new income and wealth going to the top one percent. All right, so what? I mean, yeah, it's kind of true. It depends on how you define almost all new income or wealth going to the one percent. But so what? Yes, it's true. Some of the 1% got their wealth through less than scrupulous means, mainly by using the government to cheat taxpayers. But most of the people in the 1% did not cheat their way to the top, nor did they simply inherit their money. Most of the people in the 1% got there by creating wealth. They earned their money. And in doing so, they created businesses and jobs. They invented new gadgets that improved our lives, like Steve Jobs and the iPhone. Or they made our lives better in some way, like the guys who, in, who came up with Google or YouTube. Another thing is that the 1% are not always the same people. But don't just take my word for it. Here's a much smarter guy, a professor of economics, who can say it much better than I can. I mean, the fact of inequality, what exactly is the problem uh, of inequality? Well, I think there's a couple things to talk about here. One is uh, we should ask whether that concern that we see in that video about inequality is the real issue. Whenever we talk about inequality, I think we have to also talk about income mobility. And when we look at these static snapshots of how, how, what percent of wealth or income is controlled by 1% or the bottom 20% in one year versus another year, we have to remember it's not the same people in each year who are rich and poor. And one of the most important questions for me is how easy is it or how difficult is it for folks who start off poor to no longer be poor after five years or 10 years or 15 years? That kind of data we just saw tells us nothing about that. And I think the data on income mobility suggests that the poor in any one year, the majority of them have a good opportunity to be out of poverty within a, a reasonable number of years. So as we, as we talk about these issues today, I, I hope that's something that we explore. Well said. 
And if you want to see more videos like that, you can find it at this excellent channel called Learn Liberty. I highly recommend you check out their videos, especially about wealth inequality. Which leads me to my biggest critique about Bernie Sanders, and this really deserves its own video, but I'll say it as quickly as I can. He has a very, very flawed view of our economic system, and a very, very uh, incorrect idea of how an economy works. He essentially, the, essentially his entire premise, uh, the entire foundation for his campaign, that, you know, the 1%, they're stealing from us, you know, He's, it's basically stemming from this wrong idea that wealth is a fixed asset. He believes that there is only so much money in the world, and that for someone to have a big slice of that, of that pie, metaphorical pie, well, it must mean that a lot of other people must therefore have a smaller slice of the pie. Now, again, this deserves its own video, but that is wrong. That is an incorrect view of the economy. A better way to look at the, the economy is that it's not a pie, and some people have a really big slice of it, and some people have a really small slice of it. Rather, a bunch of people are making pies, and some people can help make pies, and depending on how much, how good, how Depending on how important you are to the pie-making process, you can end up with several pies to yourself, or you might end up with a very small slice of pie. But, the, but we are constantly making pies, and we are coming up with more and more pies. But again, don't take my word for it, and this isn't an original idea. The point is that Bernie is demagoguing. He is a demagogue, because he is trying to, he is trying to exploit the prejudices we all have towards the rich. Or at least a lot of people have it. In America, weirdly, we do not suffer the same envy that a lot of people around the world do towards the rich. We, in, Americans typically don't look at rich, rich people and say, Oh, that bastard, I hate him, and I wish I had what he had. Rather, we say, Well, good for him, I'm sure he earned it, and I would like to have what he has, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna take it away from him so that way we're all equally miserable together. Also, probably the biggest critique I can make about Bernie Sanders is his extremely flawed idea of how an economy works. From what I can tell, he thinks there is a fixed amount of wealth in our economy. That is, he thinks that there is only, say, a trillion dollars in the economy, and that for any one person to have a certain amount of that money, it means that other people can't have that same money. Successful economies produce wealth, and in a good economy, everyone is made better off, though of course some be end up better off than others. The problem with the American economy today is that it is easier and more profitable to bend the government to your advantage, to basically rip off taxpayers into giving you free money, than it is to actually go out in and invent the better light bulb, or start a company, and employ people, and make an honest living. Now, if Sanders were making that critique, I might actually support him, but he isn't. He's just demagoguing about the 1% and how we have to hate them. And in that respect, he is absolutely no different from Donald Trump in trying to capture the hatred and prejudices some people feel towards other small groups and exploit that to gain power. In that sense, Bernie Sanders is the moral equivalent of Donald Trump. As for climate change and the corrupt campaign finance system we have in the United States, those are indeed real problems, but I won't get into either of them because, well, they're examples of what I mentioned earlier, at least campaign finance certainly is. That is a problem, but it is not a problem in and of itself. It is a, pr it is a symptom of a larger problem, and any attempts to correct the problem of corrupt campaign finance is going to fail unless you address the underlying cause of the problem. Hint, we have a government that does too much and is really, really powerful and thus gives people an incentive to spend money on lobbyists and politicians. As for climate change, that also really deserves its own video, but essentially whether, whether Bernie Sanders is a demagogue about that depends entirely on what he says we should do about it. And what somebody like a Trump is trying to do is to divide us up. We're supposed to... A few months ago, we were supposed to hate Mexicans, and he thinks they're all criminals or rapists. Uh, now we're supposed to hate Muslims. But you're not trying to do that, are you, Bernie? I mean, that's not at all what you're trying to do. You're not at all interested in dividing Americans, like, say, between the rich and poor, and turning the 99% the against what you demonize as the 1%. I mean, you want people to hate and scapegoat a small group 
just like Trump does, and you are proposing patently unconstitutional and unworkable policies to punish your particular bogeyman for their alleged sins, just like Trump is doing. Think about it. Nearly all of Sanders' campaign is predicated on exploiting Americans' envy of those richer than themselves, and promising to steal rich people's money and give some of the spoils to the people is largely what explains Bernie Sanders' appeal. The only other thing his campaign is based on is fear-mongering about climate change, saying we need to stop burning fossil fuels against a background picture of a nuclear power plant. Yeah, you dumbass. Uh, and that kind of crap well, is not going to yes, work in the United States of America. Well, yes, it is crap, and it is the same crap that you're shoveling, Bernie. But I'm a little less optimistic. I think that crap will work because American voters are fucking saps who gobble that crap up. I also think there's a damn good chance that come next November, one of the worst demagogues in American history will be elected president. Hillary Clinton. I think, I, I think what the American people understand is given the problems that we face, we've got to stand together, come together, and create a decent life for all of our people and, and stop this scapegoating of one group or another. Rich words coming from the man whose entire campaign is predicated on scapegoating the 1%, who's the man whose entire platform basically consists of the 1% cause all our problems in America and we can fix it simply by stealing their money. I mean, that's what your platform is, Bernie, is scapegoating. I mean, you're not at all addressing the complex economic and fiscal problems our government faces. You're just saying the 1% got their money by stealing it from us, and we're going to steal it back. When it comes to demagoguery, you're in no place to point fingers, Bernie. You're just as bad as Donald Trump. You just happen to have a bit more sense in who you're pointing your fingers at. And you're saying that the American people will understand that we need to come together? No, what do the... What do the American people understand? Well, what do they understand when it comes to government policy? Is nothing. The American people understand nothing. If they understood anything, why would they have voted twice for George Bush and Barack Obama? Then again, look at the alternatives. I think, I, I think what the American people understand is given the problems that we face, we've got to stand together, come together, and create a decent life for all of our people. Again, that is a meaningless phrase. Come together? How does a nation of 315 million people spread over a continent come together? What does that mean? And guess what? We already are creating a better life for everyone, and we are doing so through the very economic system that Sanders proclaims to hate and proclaims isn't working. Free market capitalism. To sum up, Bernie Sanders is a demagogue. Donald Trump is a demagogue. Lots of American politicians are demagogues who appeal to emotion rather than reason. Unfortunately, it's because the American people vote for these idiots. Steady job, but he wants to be a paperback writer.